This is part eight of our study in Revelation. We're in the second vision. This is the throne room vision. It's the second time that John has been in the spirit and he's been lifted up into the throne room. We've been seeing the connection of this courtroom drama to Deuteronomy and to the prophets in the Old Testament. This section is the father on the throne. In his book by book study on Revelation, Paul Blackham makes note of the rainbow that we see at the father's throne. Blackham points to Jesus in Ezekiel 1 28 as Yahweh when he appeared with the rainbow and intimates that this was in bringing judgment. In that scene, we have Yahweh, the four living creatures, and the Holy Spirit appearing, just as they do here in Revelation 4. He appears to commission Ezekiel to bring the message of judgment on apostate Israel. John, likewise, has just been commissioned by Jesus, and he's now witness to the verdict being read in God's throne room. While Paul Blackham suggests that now we see the rainbow as a sign of peace and rest in heaven, it's worth thinking of it also as a sign and reminder of judgment. Remember, redemption and judgment always come together. In fact, even as Blackham speaks of peace and rest, he refers to Noah seeing the rainbow for the first time after that great judgment that God brought on earth. It was given to Noah as a sign of the covenant of continuation that God made with him. God reiterated many of the commands that he had given to Adam in the Garden of Eden to be fruitful and multiply, to spread God's kingdom over the earth, and to have dominion over it. Recall that these covenants are pre-Abraham and certainly pre-Moses. They are the covenants that God made with all of mankind, all of creation even. Blackham points to the color green and the emphasis of the emerald as significant in relationship to creation and the earth in those scenes. This is from Blackham's book-by-book -book study. Still, this covenant of continuation that God gives Noah is also a reminder of the great judgment he brought upon the earth with the flood. As John enters this heavenly throne room of judgment, we should be reminded of this as well. God's bow, set at rest in heaven, is the bow of a warrior, and God has the right to take it up again. In fact, in his song on the plains of Moab, Moses warned that because Israel had turned their back on God after he found them in the wilderness and brought them out safely on his wings, God was going to fire his arrows at them. God the warrior is shooting arrows at Israel. Those arrows look an awful lot like the woes in Revelation. This is Deuteronomy. I will heap calamities on them and spend my arrows against them. I will send wasting famine against them, consuming pestilence and deadly plague. I will send against them the fangs of wild beasts, the venom of vipers that glide in the dust. In the street, the sword will make them childless. In their homes, terror will reign. The young men and young women will perish, the infants and those with gray hair. I will make my arrows drunk with blood while my sword devours flesh, the blood of the slain and the captives, the heads of the enemy leaders. Rejoice, ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for the land and the people. Deuteronomy 32, 23 to 25, and 42 and 43. Notice these key words in here that we'll see in Revelation. Famine, pestilence, plague, beasts, the sword, drunk with blood, sword devours flesh. He will avenge the blood of his servants. He will get vengeance. Similarly, when Jeremiah lamented the burning fire that God brought against Jerusalem previously, he wrote that he has bent his bow like an enemy with his right hand set like a foe, and he has killed all who were delightful in our eyes in the tent of the daughter of Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. Lamentations 2, 4. Why did God threaten Moses to pick up his sword and his bow and strike at Israel? And why did he then do so in Jeremiah? For the very reason that he brings this covenant lawsuit in Revelation. In Deuteronomy we read, They abandoned the God who made them and rejected the rock, their savior. They made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. They sacrificed to false gods which are not God, gods they had not known, gods that recently appeared, gods your ancestors did not fear. You deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw this and rejected them because he was angered by his sons and daughters. Deuteronomy 32, 15 to 19. Again, we see that the great crime is idolatry, abandoning God, and even rejecting the rock. We continue in the throne room and we see the 24 elders. Also in God's throne room are 24 presbyters or elders. They're seated on thrones of their own in the presence of God. Although the number 24 is uncommon in the Bible, the number 12 has a huge significance in both the Old and New Testaments, the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples of Jesus, for instance. It seems most likely that these elders are angelic creatures who represent the entire global church of both the Old and New Testaments. This is Paul Blackham speaking of numbers in his study. 
Angels, as we know, are ministering spirits. And Vern Poitras, in his commentary, says that they, like the four living creatures, are God's assistants. In addition to referring to the 12 disciples and 12 tribes of Israel, Poitras suggests that their number is significant and that it corresponds to the 24 divisions in the Aaronic priesthood. They and the church are still images of one another. On earth, the church is represented by the 12 apostles who correspond to the 12 tribes. They represent the Old Testament and the New Testament people of God. The four living creatures. We saw these beings in the very similar book of Ezekiel, where they were led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was full of eyes, and these likely represent all of creation. As Blackham has charted the significance of numbers previously, he reminds us that four represents all of creation, as in the four corners of the earth and the four winds. These four creatures likely represent earth and all the creatures of earth, obeying and giving praise to God. We've also seen the four living creatures in another covenant lawsuit case. Quote, as in Isaiah 6.3, these four living creatures declare the holiness of the Lord God in his threefold form, presumably indicating the holiness of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Representing all creation, they are doing what every creature ought to be doing, praising and serving the eternal God. Paul Blackham. That, too, was a commissioning scene in which hands were laid on Isaiah and God gave him his prophetic vision against Israel, talking of destruction and exile. He is sent to make those with eyes unable to see and with ears unable to hear. Jesus cites this passage, as does Jeremiah, and says in the Gospels that he is doing the same thing through the use of his parables. This Isaiah passage is also introducing the prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus, along with a reference to Galilee of the Gentiles, explored elsewhere in this study, as a reference to the blessing being poured out on the Gentile nations and no longer confined merely to Israel. We're seeing through the four living creatures and these references back to Noah that God is creator and sovereign over all of creation, all of the world and all of the universe. Although he promised not to wipe it out in another worldwide flood, in Revelation he is about to bring judgment once again. When he does, it is not capricious but righteous. It is the vengeance that his saints cry out for and that Jesus promised was coming upon Jerusalem, the city that killed the prophets, and upon whose head was the blood of all the righteous dead. He threatened to punish them for rejecting the rock, and we learn in the New Testament that that rock is Jesus Christ, the one they had slain.